I think you've heard enough. I've spoken so much about computers here. We've done so many presentations on, on our private group project. Uh, so I want to thank you guys so much for being here. It really means a lot to us. And your sponsorship means a lot to us. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just say that it's been a pleasure to know, get to know you. Good you are an outstanding professional. You are a really great guy. Your people skills are as good as they come. <laughs> They really, I mean, you're a Leo like me, they got me. <laughs> Tony has a great reputation. I've read uh, some outstanding articles about you. Thank you. You've been a long-standing appraiser. He's an expert uh, at what he does. We're really privileged to have these guys here today, so you guys can get started doing your presentation. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ron. You're welcome. And thank you for letting us be here. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of the presentation. Um, what we're going to talk about first, you all probably have already understood. And many of you, if not all of you, have already made the decision to do desktop appraisals. But what we're going to show you may have, may have an impact of reaffirming that decision. Hopefully it uh, shows you our perspective and our commitment to the industry at ComputerShare and where it's going. How many of you know what this is? Used to be. Average age of a, an appraiser is about 56 years old. I resemble that. <laughs> it's hard that yeah. um, This is a 1977 Oldsmobile Cutlass engine. How many of you, men or women, have ever changed oil or worked on a car before? Right? What's this? So that's the 2017 <laughs> Toyota Prius. How many work on their new cars today? I work on driving them to the dealership. Right, right. Because the, the expert is now the mechanic that can work. Uh, this is Frank. Frank worked on the 1977 Oldsmobile, right? Bob, with the white gloves, the computers, like what, three of them? He works on those Priuses. Who do you think is making more money? <coughs> Frank's not working. Yeah. Bob is. So you guys have all made that decision to stay employed. What about some of these? How many of us remember the $200 a month photo bills, right, um, every day? Now look at what it's been replaced with. How many of you made a travel arrangement coming here? Those that aren't fortunate enough to live in California, especially here, this is like really nice. I could, I could, I could live here if I could do desktop appraisals. Well, that's why I'm here. Right. <laughs> So that's all been replaced, right? It's all online. Same thing with taxes. Now, you all probably make more than uh, normal, so because you made that right decision to do desktops, so you're probably not able to utilize it by yourself, but many people are. It's, it's become much less complex through technology, data, the combination of user interface. How many of you still read newspaper? <laughs> it's, at some point, newspapers are going to be replaced, right, by digital sources. Same thing with books. Anyone remember those? I had an eight-track tape player out in the garage, and my kids said, Dad, what's that big hole? It's like, well, that's where the eight-track went. Eight-track? They had no clue. They grew up on, and they're probably in their low 20s, they grew up on cassette tapes. They had no clue what a reel-to-reel -reel tape player was, any of that. And now we've even blown past the iPod, right? Or is it I, yeah, iPod? iPad. So the same thing is going on in appraisals too. I'm going to spend just a little bit of time looking backwards, looking at where we are today and then where we think the future is going to be. How many of you remember mailing pictures or uh, appraisals? Or delivery. Delivery. We'll get there. Remember those, uh, was it like Speedy or something? You pay $8.95 and then it goes overnight. Okay. Now you just hit send, right? Yeah. So much cheaper. Fax paper. What a pain it was at the end when it turned all red. Yeah. Any of you ever look at it five years later and you can't read it? Right. right? How many of you keep your appraisals longer than five years? Why? Um, we're supposed to, I think, keep them seven years, aren't we? Five years. Oh, it's five? Or seven. two years after the end of any legis uh, litigation. litigation. Oh. Yeah. Well, I just keep them. <laughs> yeah. I like reviewing them. <laughs> you know, four and a half years later, I actually just moved to Denver and I was telling Jameis I threw away my last appraisal. I trained someone in uh, Minnesota and I carried him down to Texas and then spent some time there and then just moved to Denver. 
And it was kind of liberating not having that exposure. So anyways, uh, rub off arrows, yeah. right? Double-sided tape. Double tape, that, that was like really nice. But the glue stick, there was one in between that didn't have the purple. So all the pages would stick together. Purple was nice, so you knew where it was going. I had one of these cameras that held 12 pictures. They were all black and white. And look at where we're going now. More pictures taken on an iPhone than any, any other camera in the world. That wasn't the case years ago. How many of you, honestly, have started back here when we, when we did appraisals on carbon paper and you could erase, you could use whiteout? It's not the same thing, but that was like one page and then you did uh, Polaroid photos. So did we come more, become more efficient because of all this? Certainly it's quicker, right? You email things. Something. Yeah? yeah? You don't have to pay your photo bill. No. You don't have a uh, mail. You don't pay postage. We all have carpal tunnel syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> from, from clicking and yeah. typing? Yeah. yeah. Um, certainly it's a little bit cheaper. You have appraisal software now. You're not typing, right? Um, so things maybe have become more efficient. Does it take longer to complete appraisals? Now, if you all do just desktops, you probably don't um, relate to this, but about 10 years ago, I'd say the average was three or four appraisals a day because of uh, a number of different things. Um, less visibility into our work, um, fewer requirements, smaller scope of work. Uh, and today, the one to one and a half is the national average according to the national appraisal companies. So you can see we're doing far fewer, but our prices have gone up a little bit and our expenses have gone down. But have we really changed the way we do things? Where we are right now, uh, we're doing one to one and a half a day. Uh, we're making an hourly, if you do traditional appraisal, you're making about 50 to $75 an hour. Does anyone disagree? So average pay appraiser makes between 100, 150,000 a year doing traditional appraisals. You have all the gas, everything, all the other expenses. Um, they drive comparables. They measure houses. They type the forms. They, they do revisions. We don't get paid for any of that, right? That's just windshield time. That's a waste of money, waste of time. So what should we get paid for? What are, what are we? We're the local market expert, right? We understand the data. We understand the markets. We can identify trends. This is the stuff that we should get paid for, not this, right? We can have anyone driving comparables. So how do we get to that point? Well, we bifurcate the process. Um, bifurcate isn't anything special. It just means separate, right? And what you have is a field inspector with an appraiser. And again, this might be a little remediary but for you, but um, a lot of appraisers haven't accepted this process. But it's been done many other areas. Um, dentists, hygienists, nurses, and doctors, paralegals, and attorneys. If you had a choice, would you want to be the hygienist or the dentist? Who do you think gets paid more? Per hour, the hygienist. Per hour? No. Hygienist? Or did I, is my, is my hearing wrong? The dentist. The hygienist will spend 30 minutes on your teeth. The dentist comes in for about two minutes and says, yeah, looks good. And then they're gone, right? And they probably make two or three times what the hygienist makes. I don't want to be a hygienist. I don't want to drive comparables. I don't want to take pictures of comparables. I don't want to do any of that. I want to be the dentist. So Fannie Mae about, well, maybe a year and a half ago, January 31st, 2017, sent out a uh, selling guide announcement um, saying that their policy had been clarified, not changed, to allow an unlicensed or uncertified appraiser. Who is that? Who knows what an example is? Unlicensed, uncertified. That could be my daughter. Anyone. Right? My daughter's an unlicensed appraiser. Does, do you need a license to be an appraiser in USPAP? Licensing is a state thing. In USPAP, if you perform according to all the standards, you are an appraiser. So licensing is, is a, just a state thing. Uh, the supervisory appraiser is not required to also inspect the property. Now, there's all kinds of reasons why investors and lenders don't accept uh, appraisals like this, but this is changing. This is uh, the Fannie Mae CEO in an article published in Housing Wire, and you see the underlined area there, appraisers should be at their desks. This is the CEO of Fannie Mae. How many of you know what the de minimis level is? 
It's 250. I think it's going on. Yeah. And, and the significance is above that loan amount, transaction is a loan amount. Above that transaction amount, by law, an appraisal is required. How many understand what 250 represents for the number of transactions in the United States that would require an appraisal? Zero, zero. It's about 11%. So if it wasn't for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and FHA and VA requiring appraisals, um, we would be doing very few appraisals. So these guys really kind of dictate how appraisals are being done. Point is, when the CEO comes out and says, yeah, appraisers should be at their desks, do you think they're going to change their rules? I think they are. And if, we're, if we want to be frank, we'll be out of work. If we want to be Bob, we'll be well positioned. <laughs> so a lot of appraisers right now get really scared because it's like, well, I, I can't. I can't do the appraisal if I haven't seen the, the, the property, right? Anyone agree? So you're all ahead of the curve, and I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> this is... It takes a while for your head to get there. So we've all been going through a course, but it, it does take a while. For yeah? To Why is that? Be because we've been put to the ringer in the last 10 years. Most By whom? Well, first of all, every class you take, but just this entire downturn, and then all the UAD and everything that happened. I mean. When I started 15 years ago, and I, and I was on a computer, I wasn't doing it by paper, but it was so much easier. Um, so, yeah. There's less... Uh, it's just a mental shift. Yeah, there's more scrutiny on our work today, right? Yeah. I would agree, and some of that is our own fault. We see a lot of appraisals that are delivered to Computer Share that are 40 and 50 pages thick. Yeah. It's kind of like back to school. You know, remember uh, Rodney Dangerfield? He said, ah, this feels like a C. I need more. And it's like appraisers want more. And then they complain that the AMCs and lenders can't see their comments. It's like, well, it's buried in 40 pages of boilerplate stuff. So right there, if I was doing desktops, far, far fewer pages, right? Much less work, much easier to get your point across. Comments really matter. Um, relying on other people's information. Well, what if the inspector goes out there and it's wrong? How do we get around that? Do we go down with them? We'll, we'll, uh, we'll learn about that. AVMs, those are like really bad, right? Horrible. <coughs> what is an AVM? <laughs> well, I know what it means. I know what it stands for. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, okay. Do y'all know why the rabbit fell in the well? Rabbit didn't see that well. <laughs> um, and the accuracy of the information, what if uh, all the data is wrong? Then your appraisal's wrong, right? What, does it matter if your appraisal's wrong? Yeah. Why, who said yeah? Huh? Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that too. <laughs> so how many, how many of you have taken USPAP yet for uh, 26, 28, is it 2018, 2020? Did, no, what did you get? No, not yet. Well, you're not missing anything, right? For those that took it? <laughs> Is there any changes? They even say in the course, I teach USPAP, they say in the course material, there's no, no you know, material changes. They did no, some. No, it was, but it was. Well, they added standard four to standard three. Yeah, they, they actually cleaned it up. They made it a little more. Okay. They just made it a little more. They, they maybe they clarified said. instead of changed. Yeah, it was a waste. It was a waste of really effort, but anyway. Yeah, that's, I, I would money. That's my it's point. A, it is a money maker. <laughs> every two years, we have to put all these classes. So do you know why every two years we have that? So it's because it keeps an industry in business, I guess. It's fifty percent of the, almost fifty percent of the appraisal foundation's operating income comes from the sale of books. So do you think they're already working on the 2020, 2021? Of course they're sure. 20, They're going to reword something. Yeah, they'll they'll make some huge changes. Anyways, it's the it's the rules we have to follow, right? Mm -hmm. The more we understand them, the more we're able to make money, and we'll find out. Um, scope of work, appraisers have broad flexibility. If you remember that term, um, how many of you were appraising when we had a departure provision? And there was a hard-coded kind of, uh, this is what you got to do, but if you don't do it and you always forget about something, well, it just got turned around, right? So scope of work is, here's what I'm doing. What if you said, I'm not going to drive by the house, I'm not going to measure. I'm not going to do any of this. All I'm going to do is receive the information from someone else. Can you get criticized for not being right? You have to make an extraordinary assumption, and we'll talk about that. Um, and 
The scope of work is acceptable when it meets or exceeds the expectations of the client or the intended users for similar assignments. So if everyone else is doing a desktop appraisal the same way, do you think your clients and intended users understand that? So there's not going to be a different expectation that you validate the information, <coughs> that you go out and measure the house, that you go inside the house, right? Um, but you do have to make an extraordinary assumption. And that basically says if I get bad stuff, it's going to impact the value. And we're comfortable with that, right? Because then it's like, well, I told you so. But are you going to be liable? No. There is virtually no liability in a desktop appraisal. Do we all agree? Yes. So you guys are ahead of the curve anyways. Because you're already, number one, you're already here. But number two, you're already doing them, right? Wait, you're saying there's no liability? Virtually. There's liability. I mean, there's liability and everything, right? Sign our name. Yeah. But you don't sign your name to something someone else gave you. You're responsible for your portion that you control. You screw up and add it wrong. Or yeah. But I'm not Use the wrong the methodology. Off, it's not my fault. Correct. You adjust inconsistently, shame on you. That, yes. You own that. But I'm assuming everyone does all that, right? But what if we have really horrible inspectors? We do. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, we do. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of appraisers that mismeasure. I'm a mentor, and well, I was and, until I moved last week to Denver. In Texas, when you have a disciplinary action, you get the opportunity to be mentored by a USPAP instructor. And there's people, there's appraisers that have included garages in the gross living area when they park cars there. <laughs> so it's like totally wrong. Everyone makes mistakes. But when you're not measuring it, that, that's off your radar. You don't have to be responsible for that. Drive-by and desktop appraisals. Does USPAP permit real, real property appraisers to perform drive-bys? There's a lot of appraisers, not you guys, that say, oh, I can't do a drive-by. It's in a rural area. I, I just have no idea what's around it. Well, we get around that by looking at Google Earth, right? There's technology, just like what we learned with cameras and Photoshops that do that. This is actually in USPAP. Do, how many of you uh, refer back to USPAP on a regular basis? No one else has it on their nightstand. <laughs> I had it out at uh, on the plane on the way here, and the gal next to me says, "That's an interesting book." <laughs> I left her my copy. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. I never travel with it anymore. Um, an appraiser may use any combination of a property inspection and documents to identify the relevant characteristics of the subject property. Now, you do have a burden to have enough information to produce credible assignment results, right? USPAP has no requirement to inspect the subject property's interior. It's another place appraisers get hung up on. Well, it's a million dollar house, I gotta see what's inside. Have you ever seen a million dollar house get marketed? It's like the photographer goes in and spends three days there, right? Taking video, multiple, I mean, you, there's enough information on the inside to assume that you were there almost. How about uh, virtual reality? That's here already, right? This right here, when I sold my house in Dallas, um, they came in and had a camera that spun around, and it created a virtual floor plan. And from that floor plan, they measured the house. And just like Google Earth for streets, you can navigate through a house like this, right? Mm -hmm. Companies called Matterport. I had a a really cool link in here that we could have saw Matterport work, but Jameis <laughs> made me take it out for, for time. For long-winded reasons. Right, right. <laughs> but trust me, it's really cool. And we're going to start seeing a lot of this stuff. You guys probably already have. Maybe not the goggles, but certainly other people taking your pictures, providing it to you in a different format. Um, so what's next? We saw what was going on before. We looked a little bit at what we're... Uh, up to today. Looking forward, and again, you guys are probably on the front end of the curve um, by doing this, but by having an open mind. A lot of appraisers are very closed-minded. I like this guy for some reason. He's a prolific uh, quote, quote producer. So a mind is like a parachute. It doesn't work if it's not open. If an appraiser isn't open to different things, do you think they're going to be like Frank or like Bob? Mm -hmm. Frank. Same guy, Thomas Dewar. The only thing that hurts more than paying an income tax is not having to pay an income tax at all. Think Frank's paying more income tax or Bob? 
this is going to change. And I know you guys know this. So Bob's paying more tax than Frank. We know that. So where are we going to go tomorrow? We're going to do either, appraisers are either going to do one or two a day or maybe 10 a day. And do we all understand why? How many of you uh, used a travel agent when you came here? No. No. But now if you were going to go from here, maybe to San Francisco to St. Louis, I mean, I'd screw that up. I'd want a travel agent to help me with the real complex ones. And I think that's the same thing that's going to happen on appraisals. Not everything can be done on a desktop, right? Because you wouldn't maybe get in, uh, your intended user may not be satisfied. It may not be credible. There might be some functional obsolescence issues that the inspector doesn't identify. But your average hourly income is going to be over $100 an hour. So appraisers that look at, um, and we've had appraisers say, well, I don't get out of my house for less than $800. I'd rather say I, I don't work for less than $100 an hour. And we'll, we'll look at the math. But you're going to make a lot more money focusing on an hourly wage than you do on a per unit. Our world is going to be consumed with data. Data, number one, but the acronym as well. Display, analytics, technology, and analysis. <coughs> Excuse me, how many of you would agree that appraisals, desktop appraisals look more like this than traditional 1004s? A lot of them have pictures, a lot of them have charts and graphs. These more visually and e more easily identify the trends for the intended user. To me, I think this is a benefit, not a distraction. This helps us. And you see the analytics that are incorporated into the appraisal reports. Um, technology, just like taking pictures on an iPhone rather than a 35 millimeter camera. We're going to be logging on. Someone asked, is the uh, appraisal all on the web? There's no more typing, is there? There's a lot of tech, well, maybe there is a little bit, but there's a lot of, a lot of technology, a lot of things, automated form population. We get our MLS given to us rather than get, we give it to them or to the form. And that's really important for the users. I would much rather see what the appraiser didn't use than what the three that they used. How many could, uh, not that you ever have or even thought about it, but how many could uh, fabricate a value to make a house look like it's 100,000 more than what it is? Sure. Yeah. Easily. It's kind of easy, right? And you'd be amazed how often it happens. <laughs> no? It's only until you see what they don't use that it, it's really apparent. Analysis, and this again is where you want to be the dentist, not the hygienist. You want to spend your time where your expertise is best suited. You want to be the one that analyzes the data and identifies those trends and then communicates that to your client because you, know, you understand it. You want to be the local market expert. Two things that appraisers separate themselves from anyone else. Anyone have an idea? Understanding of the standards. If we didn't understand USPEM and what we can and can't do, we'd be no different than a broker, right? And a, a real estate agent. And local market expertise. If we don't understand the methodology, the trends, the analysis, how to interpret the data, we'd be no different than anyone else. So we have to be very knowledgeable. Predictive analytics, anyone know what this is? I bet you do. Amazon, right? Have you ever ordered anything and then it says, people like you have ordered this too? Mm -hmm. That's very simple. That, that's getting used all the time today. And so when it's used in an AVM or um, another kind of model, you can understand how that works, right? If we see this, well, then we're, we're apt to see this or it's more probable to see another event. You see it in Amazon, you see it in Walmart. They know that when uh, an item is sold, like a plant, that someone's going to also get a watering can. And so when one gets ordered, the other one gets ordered. You have Chick-fil-A here? Uh, no. Yes. Yeah? In <laughs> yeah. So at Chick-fil-A, they, they know that um, a successful employee is going to smile eight times in the interview process. That's a predictive analytic, right? Mm -hmm. If they don't smile eight times, they don't get hired because they're not going to be successful. There's no science, well, maybe a little bit of science, but there's... Yeah. 
So when you uh, use AVMs in a desktop appraisal as uh, an appraiser, you have to understand how it works, right? Advisory Opinion 18 helps us with that. Have you all read that? Yeah, one. So we all should read that because that's what separates us from brokers. But it also helps us understand what our obligations are. When using an AVM, and that's basically what populates the computer share desktop, is an AVM, but it's an aggregated MLS provider. But it's ranked, the sales are ranked for display only, not for use, based on similarity. So that algorithm is working in the background. That's what makes it a model. You don't have to build the model. You just have to have a basic understanding of how that model works. Does that make sense? Yeah. Could you explain that to a client? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. There's aggr aggregated MLS that's displayed to me based on differences and similarities, and then I choose. That's your basic understanding. Appraiser does not need to know or be able to explain how the algorithm works and all the interests, Interest. all the details, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, but they should be able to describe the AVM's overall process, blah, blah, blah. So we, we have all that already, right? Five critical questions to answer. Does the appraiser have a basic understanding? Yes, and this is in Advisory Opinion 18, but we, we have a USPAP obligation to understand how the model works. Can the appraiser use the AVM properly? Yes. Are the AVM and the data it uses appropriate given the intended use? Is the search area the same as your market area? That's a fancy way to say, is it, is it okay? Is the AVM output credible? I mean, you should probably get some comfort with the AVM or the uh, provider, like ComputerShare. I encourage you to open up your own MLS and, and match it up. And if there's problems, call Jameis. Mm -hmm. If it works really well, tell me. <laughs> is the AVM output sufficiently reliable for use in the assignment? Once you get comfortable with that, you don't have to check it over and over again, unless, you, unless something doesn't seem right. So here we talk about the hourly rate. We kind of already went over that, but the difference is amazing. If you focus on making $50 per assignment, it takes you 30 minutes to do it. Some appraisers would say, there's no way I'm gonna do an appraisal for less than $400. They're the francs. If you do $50 for 30 minutes, you're making $100 an hour, that's 200,000 a year. You could live here in Carmel. Maybe. I was walking by the real estate place. It's amazing <laughs> how much my living room would sell for like a million dollars here. <laughs> but you get the point, right? And all of you, I mean, again, all of you have already uh, come to this realization, but hopefully this reaffirms what you already know. So we're entering into a new era, a new uh, opportunity for a lot of appraisers. And I think you'll see more and more of this as we continue to evolve. The agencies are very much committed to having alternatives. FHFA, their regulator, has given them a mandate to look at modernizing, that's the euphemism they use, really changing the appraisal process. So you will see, even in 1004s, you might be doing a 1004, but have someone else do an inspection. But it'll be on a 1004 form. So the form shouldn't concern you either. And you have a decision to make, right? Who do you want to be? Uh, yeah. Wait, go back. You're saying, what are they looking at? They're looking at breaking up the 1004 like this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's been some pilots where there's a property question, property data questionnaire, uh -huh. PDQ, uh -huh. and someone else goes out and it kind of replicates the front page of the 1004. Okay. And then an appraiser at a desk does the 1004. Okay. So that ATI, ATI is working on that right now. Yeah. Assurant with Chase. Yeah, it's, it's a tremendous secret. Channel, channel, four, <laughs> yeah. channel 4 report, appraiser completes it, but somebody else provides all the data or does all the measurement or whatever yeah. it is that they want them to do. Yeah. So should it matter what form it's on? If we're comfortable with the bifurcated process, we accept that inspection. If it's an interior inspection, would we be comfortable with some of the technology we just saw? Sure. Yeah. So it should, you know, the reporting format shouldn't, shouldn't concern you. Yeah? In some ways, we do that now with parts of our report. We depend on the photos and the description of the interior of every comp we put in our report. We don't go in those homes. Yeah, and that's a really good point. You assume that the MLS is accurate? Yeah. 
Yeah. So is there any, um, what kind of liability is the person who does the inspection? So for example, we know with when there's reports there's sort of sometimes photos won't be taken of some deferred maintenance or some issues. They won't mention um, something odd with the floor plan. And so uh, I guess the question is how well is this person trained or what's their incentive to, you know, be why do we care? We give everything. Well, well from your perspective, maybe not, but if you're asked to do that inspection. Right. As an appraiser, would you be doing an, an appraisal? How many no, of you? I meant the person, so whoever's providing it. It's not appraiser who's doing that inspection, is it, or is it? Well, it could be. What if you're asked? So let's say the inspector is an appraiser, and they get $150. Would you mind if you went? How long does it take you to inspect a house? Uh, 45 minutes. Okay, so you're making a hundred. I don't know how to do the math. 175. You just blew. You just blew Bob out of the water as far as income, right? And then there's drive time and expenses and everything else. But you're making, you know, okay. 200000 a year. But you still have responsibilities under USPEP, but you don't have to comply with the standards mm -hmm. or any of the, um, uh, just the standards. Mm -hmm. You still have to uh, comply with the rules, the ethics rule, work file rule, all that. Right. Um, and it would be appraisal practice if you're engaged as an appraiser. Mm -hmm. okay. But less liability, no standards, you're not doing the review, or the appraisal, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, who are you going to be? And I think you all have made that decision, um, but if you haven't, um, understand that computer share is committed to this because the industry is committed to this, it's going to happen. And we want to be positioned among the leaders rather than the ones trying to catch up. Any questions on any of what we saw? Went through it really quick because the good stuff is coming up. <laughs> I was, I was going to say the opposite. <laughs> Did I understand that a licensed or an unlicensed person could do computer share? Is that what I understood? The inspection. It's about the inspection per part. The inspection. The products we're going to talk about today are all still considered appraisals, signed by certified or licensed appraisers. We do offer some value reconciliation type work that's not considered an appraisal that we don't always use licensed appraisers for, but that's not the purpose of what okay. we're talking about today. If, if you have a trainee, and so he goes does the inspections for you or whatever else, mm -hmm. he can log that? Yeah. Yeah. And that was the selling guide um, notice from last January from Fannie Mae. That was the purpose of it, is to inspire appraisers to take on trainees. But most lenders won't allow it. They that's still the that's, our that's our that bridge. There's a lot of lenders that will. And if you, I mean, all, uh, it's an education opportunity. The state of Washington, my understanding is they uh, passed the legislation that lenders cannot bar trainees from doing uh, work without the appraiser. Yep. I was just at the. Am I right? Yeah, you're all right. Absolutely. So in Washington, they're not legally, they're not allowed to say that the you can't, can't go along. The problem is that a lot of the major lenders aren't regulated by the states, and the states don't have authority. If they did work in the state of Washington, they cannot say that, the, that I, I have to go. But the national banks aren't regulated by the states, so they have a what's called preemption. So they're kind of a, out of that realm of authority. But all your mortgage lenders, non-bank non lenders, have to follow the state law. I was just this weekend um, at the Association of Appraiser Regulatory Officials Conference, and that was a big topic about standardizing some of the criteria for doing appraisals and getting trainees into the industry, having different approaches to gaining that experience. Yeah? Okay. My question is, I'm starting to do the hybrid products mm -hmm. and a third party. And, and made the inspection. Is there any training in the industry regarding the inspection and the photos that are necessary? Are they starting to do that? So these mm -hmm. providers that, that we're using, are they getting some training, Tony, and, uh, and some uh, you know guidance? They are. Absolutely. Um, and we, we have criteria and standards that mm -hmm. we communicate to our inspectors. Um, but are the appraisers? No. But do you need an appraiser to take a picture? No, I don't, but I do need pictures of certain things. You want to make sure yeah. you have them all. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. That, that's what I'm saying. But they're being trained well, to take Well, we get to make yeah. an extraordinary yeah. assumption that they're shut well, to and, a certain thing. And the majority yeah, of the course. hybrid work that's being performed today is typically exterior forms. So there's really so, all, so much you can see from the exterior of that home without trespassing on the property anyway. 
Right. So we want to get you know left side, right side, front views up and down the street, address verification to make sure you've got the right home. But a close up of the peeling paint on the rear of the property, you can't really get that on an exterior because you can't step on the land. Right. What's, what's, um, what is important is we were speaking about external obsolescence early, earlier quite a bit. Can, oh, you, can yep. be accurate, right? And here's the thing. So in that instance, the appraiser did, the, did not report the obsolescence, which was obvious, right? So how did we find it through Google Earth? Right. I can tell you this, Tony, uh, with all my years of experience, and I do a lot of your uh, desktop appraisals, without Google Earth, I would not feel as confident because even an appraiser misses obsolescence sometimes, no less a provider. Mm -hmm. But that tool, it mitigates that fact. No. Well, what I'm talking about, I've done some hybrids where there are interior, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the photos are not what appraiser would take. You know, I have no pictures of, of HVACs. You know, they mm -hmm. might give me a picture of the roof, but the major components of the house is what I need to see. I don't need to see the bedroom. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Uh -huh. Are they, you know, getting training about... Mm -hmm the photos that are really necessary for the appraiser to make a judgment. One of, that's a fantastic point, Kathy. And I'll tell you right now, and you've heard me say this before, uh, me and Steve have talked a lot about it, and you know where they're going to get that training from? From feedback that we give computer share. Mm -hmm. That that's what we require. That's what we need. Well, that's what I'm saying. Uh, no, I, I, and, uh, well, well, I got you, Kathy. Okay. <laughs> but isn't that really what you're looking for? Absolutely. Now? Yeah. And, and if at any time you don't feel comfortable, because there isn't enough, in, you know, enough yeah. information to identify the property characteristics, that's an obligation in USPEP, then you should say no. It's okay to say no. But it's okay to say yes to something less than yourself going into the house. Yeah. And I really appreciate hearing, yes, I can proceed if you get me this much more, and then I can go back and get more. Yeah. yeah. And so, and I'm always open to that. It's not a take it or leave it with the assignment. If I was just mentioning that if the data doesn't come through and it's not enough to form an opinion or to extract the right comps that you need, we can engage another data provider or a local agent or broker from our um, BPO network and be able to get that information in our hands and in your right. hands. Well, this wasn't your company that I did it for. It was another company. Which one? But um, <laughs> major competitor. I'm I mean, kidding. You know, but you know, the never heard of them. Just they, they didn't give me the necessary things that I needed to make an evaluation. Well, mm -hmm. right. They I, gave I, me a lot of junk. I will yeah. be candid with you, Tony. I taught a private group coaching class on properties that you would likely reject based on my experience mm -hmm. that don't suit this product. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have an oddball, unique property, some. 50-acre estate, uh, it may not suit it because of uniqueness, right? Right. Yep. No, it doesn't work for everyone. Right. Yep. I got a good one for that. I had a, um, a client hit us up and said, can you do an, a desk review on this? It was like an appraisal X style property. And we Googled in, get on the home. The house is, it's kind of like the builder's spec home that he built in a cookie cutter cutter residential subdivision on two and a half acres and he's the only one with water frontage on the pond and then every house around it is standard cookie cutter homes there was nothing like that subject anywhere near it and we turned it down we told him that yes we can do it but we need a full appraisal you need somebody to, that does that market and drive it and it's not appropriate for this product um, and having Tony's support on those of saying, yeah, this, this doesn't fit everything, right? Not, not every single property can be done with a hybrid. You have to know when to recommend an escalation. And as we move forward, um, the agencies aren't going to allow these on every property, right? Right. How many of you heard of property inspection waivers? There's no appraisal on those. Well, there's an old appraisal, right. but they have enough data available and the credit criteria are such that they feel comfortable saying you don't have to get an appraisal. And that... That's going to be a chunk. And then the desktops, based on other criteria, will be another chunk. And then the most complex, right, are going to still be done by appraisers or someone that physically visits the property because of that complexity. Yeah. So it almost seems like going out in the field will be just for atypical properties, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Future yeah. I, th I think appraisers are going to get paid a lot more, the ones that go out to the field. Mm -hmm. But it's going to take you all day, maybe two days to get them done, right? More like a, a commercial appraiser than a residential appraiser. But the other ones, if you focus on the hourly wage, you're going to make more money. So two questions. 
the individuals selected to do the inspections, hmm? uh, who might they be? And uh, uh, one company I was talking to, they want licensed people. Yeah. Licensed inspector, or licensed real estate mm -hmm. agent, or uh, I've seen I think a, license, a, a, a trainee with, yeah. you know, with, with a license. Right. I'm hearing that, that maybe you guys don't care about the license aspect as long as the person is somehow qualified. We use licensed No, we use licensed agents, agents and brokers. Real estate agents. We're saying that the, the FANI, or the, um, the announcement said that you don't have to use licensed. Okay. We see the industry going appraisers. that way, um, but right now on the products that we're offering, the Appraisal X today is licensed real estate agents and brokers. Um, we will have a, a version of that product that will be drive-bys only, where we may use inspectors that are not real estate agents or brokers. Okay. Um, and then we're actually looking at making a hybrid version of that product where we use an appraiser and still bifurcating the process between the two. There will be some appraisers that just do inspections out there and they can make what they need to on an hourly basis doing the inspection and you could have a different appraiser do the desktop in a short period of time um, and be able to deliver a report, hybrid report that's both completed by an appraiser doing the inspection and measuring the home and a desktop appraiser doing the report. So what I sense is that in the early period of this, there's going to be some issues with these inspections and the information provided back to an appraiser until, as Ron said, there's, there's a learning curve here for them as to what is going to be needed no through, through feedback. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Tony, person. Yep. You know, I've, I've done a lot of desktops and uh, you know, I've been very candid about why, because I want to stay ahead of the curve. I want to be, what's his name? Uh, Bob. I want to be Bob. Um, you know, by the way, I live out here, and the only reason I do is because I can bring my business any place I go. I bring right. it in New York, uh, uh, Washington, and here, because of the business, right? Because of the portableness of the business. So this is this phenomenal product that can work out the right way. Now, having said that, I was one of the earliest per people I know working on hybrid products. And I'll just be very candid, and I wasn't doing it for you. They were a mess, mm -hmm. okay? They were a mess, really. And they were a mess early on because the people out in the field hadn't had the experience, nor had the uh, client uh, have, uh, gotten good feedback from the appraisers. So I started to provide a lot of that because it's the only way I saw it could really work out. Now, I mm -hmm. will tell you, when I look at a desktop today as compared to a year or so ago, it's completely different oh, yeah. in terms of that quality. Yep. No doubt about it. When I was at U.S. Bank, any of you ever do a CVR, collateral evaluation report? So maybe about 10 years ago now, we did probably 2,000 of those a month at U.S. Bank. And we had very specific criteria for the inspectors slash appraisers to go out. And it was primarily trainees, and it was in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, so it was very controlled. Um, but with the right direction, you get the right response. And I think that's where we've learned from early days is to provide more training, more guidance, kind of keep you in the box for the inspectors. Now, are these reports going to be used for FHA lending? FHA, that's a good question. They, they require certified appraisers to visit the property okay. um, so they don't have that flexibility that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have introduced. Okay. And that'll, that'll take an act of Congress, yeah. literally, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to change that. As far as screening these properties to put them into these categories of whether they are the desktop or the field inspection, how is that going to be accomplished? I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's, and a lot of times we just get an address. I mean, all the time we just get an address with the order, get the inspection done. There is a going to kind of go through this in a little bit, but there is a quality control step where we're looking at that inspection before we hand it to the appraiser. And if we see anything that jumps out at us, like we couldn't get any kind of data from the data providers that we purchased from, no public records available because it's non-disclosure, houses in the middle of nowhere, not visible from the road, probably not a good candidate for a desktop assignment. But I do rely on the appraisers that get the work to open it up and tell me, hey, whoa, Jameis, I can't take this, and here's why. Um, you know, yeah. That is a, that is a yeah. standard rule, well, that you and, have to have enough uh, information to mm -hmm. accurately um, understand the property characteristics. If you don't get enough data, if you don't get enough uh, property records, you know, say no, it's okay. Yeah. To say I no. I don't think, Wayne, you saw my 15 reasons to reject hybrid report. Uh, I, don't, I don't think you did. I'm saying that uh, rhetorically. Uh, and I will tell you, 
it's a good point. That of course, you're trying to screen. Yeah, you try. I mean, you try, but really, am I right? You're looking for the appraiser to tell you, yeah, the desktop person, hey, yeah, you're night, yeah, or these are the issues. Mm -hmm. yep. I mean, that's real because you're the expert, right? You're the expert rather than even a, a clerk or back office person that's helping out who may do a pretty good job, but you, they're not going to catch all this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's really imperative, I'm telling you, to do this business. I see it as it worked for me. You've got to really look at it and provide the feedback to the client. Yep. It happens often. And, and we try and put it on our clients, too, and give them a list of qualifying items of what a product like this is good for um, and what attributes about the property they should maybe think twice and escalate to like a full interior 1004, um, the historical version anyway. And I have a client right now that continually orders drive-by hybrid appraisals on properties that have been upgraded and remodeled since they were last listed online, and no one can tell the difference. Mm -hmm. And then when you come in at C4 condition, average, middle-of-the-road value tier, and their borrower thinks it's worth $70,000 more because I have a brand new kitchen and I've redone everything, like, well, we can't tell that from the drive-by, and I'm not going to ask an appraiser to assume that what your borrower said about it being upgraded is true. We need photos, we need an inspection. Um, so we constantly push back on the clients for those type of things as well. And we're, we're trying to change the way people think about these products and, and understand that it's not one size fits all, all the time. Um, but it's a, it's a battle. One well, <laughs> thing that, that you all are talking version. about here. Yeah, I'm sorry. One thing I really like about the approach that you're describing here is that you provide a, a set of comps to pick from. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I do desktops pretty much the way the hybrid reports that you're talking about. And all they do is give me some pictures of the property, and then I do everything else. I go get the comps from the MLS, I type them up, I put them in the report. And I constantly get questions after that. Well, what about this? What about this? What about this? Well, I said, well, you know, I went and looked and picked the best ones that I mm -hmm. could find. Right. If, if you have a universe that you want me to look at, tell me what they are. I'll look at them and give you comments. Or better yet, provide it to you. And, and that's, yeah. I really like the way you yeah. describe it here. Mm -hmm. Because that gives me the parameters around which I'm going to be judged. Mm -hmm. Don, and you had a question as well? Well, I'm just curious, if it escalates to a full appraisal, are you assigning, are you assigning yep. those also? Yes. So the same group of appraisers or a different... Group of could be, it, you know, it, if you it could be. To do all of it, oh yeah, yeah. If, yeah, you, once if you cover, you decide what products you want to do with us based on your coverage areas. And if you're Ron and I've talked about this on, some people may have one coverage area for review work, some may have a different coverage area for desktops, and some and even a third coverage area for field work. We have the flexibility to set that up based on product. So if you want to do 1004s and 2055s in two counties. Fine. If you want to do desktops in four counties and then reviews in the rest of your state, we can set all those up and you'll only get assignments for those work in those coverage areas. What we've also seen is that the desktop appraisers are the smart bunch out of the, the whole thing. And they, they only want to do desktop, so they don't want to do a traditional appraiser, appraisal. And vice versa, the, tra mm -hmm. the traditional appraiser people are like freaking out about desktops. So right now it's kind of like a civil engineer and a mechanical engineer. You know, there's the, both appraisers, but they do different disciplines, different yeah. kind of things. There's, there's very. <laughs> if you're comfortable doing that, <laughs> I, I run across very few appraisers that are proficient in doing both. Yeah. It's they just shit. make a choice in their business yeah. on how they want to run it, and and a lot of the ones that stick their heels in on the field work, I don't think have bought into the concept of. I can do more volume and still provide good quality and make just as much money, but I don't have to make an appointment with a borrower. I don't have to fill up my gas tank. I'm not fighting traffic, and I'm not set up on somebody else's schedule for inspections. The commute is from your bedroom to the den. It's not 45 minutes in traffic. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of advantages. And Alan, you don't have to purchase any data. I haven't purchased data in 10 years. Well, that's what I like. I yeah. Mean, and the parameters are all known. I mean, you know what I'm looking at. Mm-hmm. Uh, and all yep. I have to explain to you is why I picked what I picked if you have a question. Mm -hmm. you know, why this one instead of this one? And the universe is known. Yeah. Well, and we displayed all of those comps that we gave to you back to our client to show them everything that we looked at. So it's about being as transparent as possible and then picking what you're going to hang your hat on and being able to defend why you didn't pick the other ones. Right. As long as you can comply with USPEP, you have enough information to identify the property characteristics and you produce a credible result. As long as you do your part of USPAP, you're okay. Yeah, that's great. And that's less liability than looking at the house. 
Any of you ever shown up at the wrong house? Oh, yes. <laughs> I have. <laughs> I've taken pictures and started measuring before I realized yeah. there's a wrong <laughs> I've, I've knocked on the door and they said, what? But it was like 29th and a half street yeah. instead of 29th street. Oh, yeah. Um, or forgot to take a picture of the house or the back and you have to go back out. Well, that sucks. None of that. None of that here. A lot of the frustrations go away. The growing pains of this, it, therein lies the opportunity. Mm. That really is the truth. If you're in front of this, therein really lies the opportunity. If you get it and you adapt to this and you accept this and you move on and you become Bob, therein lies the opportunity. When it's all said and done in a year or two, we won't be having these conversations. Anymore. Right. No, it'll be it's it'll be the norm. It'll be the norm. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask, like, any, Who's any idea, like, the norm timetable, the timetable when the desktop work is going to be like the norm? It's I would have guessed based on, uh, when is it going to get going? Yeah. I would have guessed based on Fannie Mae's announcement last January that we'd already be there. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, well, we're, already, we're using them, and I bet there's a dozen other, maybe 20 other providers around the country, large companies. Um, you don't need 100 orders a month from one company if you get 10 orders from 10. You're going to stay busy. So, how do you think the um, leveling of the market and and you know typical cycles are going to affect their willingness to use this? Like when the market turns down, what's that going to do for this type of work? I mean, you know, I don't. I, I'm not convinced that the accuracy of a full appraisal inspected by an appraiser is any less or more uh, accurate than. A desktop? Less accurate if they've done a lot of interior remodeling that nobody knows sure. about. Sure. Right. Right. Or there's a yeah. bunch of hidden damages that nobody's ever seen. Sure. Right. And sure. But often that's going to yeah. show up on the outside. But and I think I mean Fanny's already talking about it being okay to use alternative um, products in origination, but it's going to take the big lenders of the country to make that shift. And once one of them does it. If a Wells or a Chase or somebody out there does that first, everybody else is going to see that they're doing it and that it's acceptable, and it'll just and they are be quick. The chief appraiser at Freddie Mac. I don't do these on purchases. I do them right now for uh, home equity, and yeah, I also yeah, do them yeah. for Couple. secondary market trades where pools of loans are getting right. sold yeah, back and forth. Yeah, but there are there are institutions that are doing these on on purchases. Mm -hmm. If you uh, let's just say everything lines up, you uh, have an 800 FICO score, you make 200 thousand a year, and you're borrowing 50 grand. Do you need a 1004? No. no. Yeah. No. So, I, had a, I had a really good analogy for that when I was pitching products like this before and I always compared it to my brother, myself, and my parents. And so for my parents, you know, A plus credit, they've got money in the bank, they're professionals, great in their career, they get an ABM to get a home equity loan or even an origination. I've got a decent job, I've got decent credit, but I don't have as much of my assets and I don't have as much to back everything, so they may go with a hybrid for me. My brother, full-blown interior appraisal, maybe two of them, <laughs> right, <laughs> to make sure that that's all going to match up. And, and there's credit profiles where those things will work. Um, and yeah, I mean, I started in my career in banking at Bank of America when I was 20 years old, and I was just in a branch, but we were doing equity lines on AVMs all day. And we all Texas know how that worked out. Um, <laughs> we all, I'm not saying that was a good thing. Um, putting eyes on the property now, though, and making sure that the condition hasn't changed, or if it's a manufactured home, that it hasn't been towed away. You know, that, a lot of those things, um, we, we've progressed a little bit. <laughs> but if you had a home inspector on a purchase, and that information were available to the uh, appraiser. It'd be fine. Yeah. Fine. Mm -hmm. They would just get them to take interior photos instead of photos under the sink. Well, the listing on my house I just sold in Dallas had that um, Matterport is the name of the camera. It had pit, they had a professional photographer come out, and then someone else that did that camera that spun around. There was more interior stuff. I mean, it, it, it it's all there. Yeah. Sir. How often? Awesome. Um, do you get pushback on um, like your product appraisal acts for equity lines? Pushback from the client? Pushback from the borrower who says, who, who a, says a wait lot. a minute, uh, you know, my house is worth more than you. <laughs> no. I know I'll be honest. Yeah. <laughs> How much you get on, on appraisals today? You yeah. Know, yeah. yeah. You know. No, Steve, it's, um, I get a lot of pushback from borrowers on these type of products, and typically it's the scenario I gave where if they've done interior upgrades to their property that no one knows about, yeah. and their lender ordered a drive-by. Yeah. 
And so I stick, dig my heels in and say, sorry, this is, this is all we can do. There's, there's the only comps that support something higher are typically remodeled and we'll do the research. And I try and protect the appraiser internally from even having to look at those again. My staff goes through and searches all the comps. If the lender comes back and says, please check 123 Main Street, 456 North Street, and tell us why you didn't come in higher, we do all of that research and reply to the client if we think those comps are relevant and we don't even bother our appraiser. The majority never sees, the appraiser never sees. Yeah. We're really trying to keep that separation because, I mean, I'll come back to you if I think there was a mistake made or there's new information that we didn't know about that we should have known about and ask for the appraiser to be re-engaged. Mm -hmm. And if we have to compensate you more for it, great. That's fine too. Um, but for the frivolous kind of pushbacks and for, for unnecessary reasons, it, it, we, we try and protect you guys as much as possible. Um, I've got a few more slides. I want to talk to you guys about the company a little bit. Yeah. I've got a quick question. Well, I'll be quick. Okay, just to lay it out for you. I'm not an appraiser, Tony. I don't know any of this. I only know it. From She's my wife, though, Tony. You've got to answer her okay. question. She my wife's a better appraiser than I am. Yeah, so is mine. <laughs> the question that always comes up. Since you're a use cap instructor and in private group coach, and whenever we start talking about liability and that, is it, and Ron, maybe you can help me out with the verbiage I'm trying to get at, but is it BPOs or something that they don't sign their name, but are they acting as an appraiser, and so do they? And where does the liability fall? Is that non-signature? Non-signature. It all depends on how you're engaged. And again, you go back to use cap advisory opinion 20. Y'all remember that thing that looks like an egg? So that center part, that's appraisal, an appraisal review. That's your most intense obligation to use PEP, all the standards, all the rules. The middle part, the gray area, that's just the rules, not standards one through 10. And then the outside is uh, valuation services. That's when you just do a something, not, how about, in, like a, it's easy to explain in a small town where you have a broker license and an appraiser license and you're asked to do a BPO because you're a broker. Well, they didn't ask you to do it because an appraisal because you're an appraiser. So you have your broker hat on, not your appraiser hat. If you're gonna do a reconciliation, you put on your reconciler's hat rather than your appraiser's hat. And you're engaged understanding that you're not an appraiser. And that's fully fine. That's, the that's very compliant. Right. As long as your client, you don't misrepresent that you're an appraiser to your client. I'm not doing this as an appraiser. But Tony, doesn't the higher licensing standard trump the other? As an appraiser, you are an appraiser. And if it comes down to it, and, and you're an appraiser and you're a broker, doesn't the, I thought, I don't mean it as a leading question, but I thought that the higher standards of licensing apply. Even if you're talking about, you put your, well, I'd much rather be an appraiser than a, a broker. I know we, we pay our brokers a tenth of what we pay our appraisers, and they'll, they, they work for much less. So maybe from that perspective, but I can also tell you when I was going through the USPAP instructor's course, there was probably an hour of discussion about this because everyone disagreed. Once you're, they all thought once you're an appraiser, it's hard not to be an appraiser and take your appraiser hat off. Mm -hmm. I still, I, you know, Honestly, I think it would be a little bit gray to say I'm not an appraiser, but if you really understand USPAP and apply the principles appropriately and correctly, it's entirely acceptable to do that. Advisory opinion 20. That, that, that is the same feedback I got from another. Whew. Mm -hmm. That was the same feedback. Tell me the right <laughs> stuff. I told him he had to answer and, all those questions and actually, today. <laughs> um, and actually, uh, he, he said that, that was the issue we've had because it's hard for us to take off the appraiser hat, right? We keep saying, well, but if we, if we whether we sign it, we don't sign it, we're an appraiser, how are we engaged? And Hansel said the same answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, he did. He said the same answer. We're still stuck on it, though. Let's let's be honest. <laughs> well, I think and, well, I, I, I have think heartburn the, over it. I, I think I the do. states the states get stuck on it too. There's yeah. some states look at it differently than others. Yeah. That's a decision you guys got to make. <laughs> it's a I have my opinion. Read use, Pep. Can I have this? Yeah. Yep. So. I think at the end of the day, if a person feel like they can do a credible job and they they kind of have their arms wrapped around it, they will buy into it. It's just yeah. it just takes a while to shift. That's, right. a, that's, you know. yep. that's how yeah. I feel, quite frankly. Yeah. 
And I am concerned that I have to shift all the way because I don't know, I think it's going to be hard for me to do the field work, you know, to be as efficient doing both. I might stay in my small town or to the two towns I'm nearby where I can just knock them out pretty fast. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I'm going to be saying no to anything outside of a certain radius. Just the two towns that I live yeah. close, are in or closest to and the rest of them want to do desktop. Yes. Yeah. You know. No, and, and there's different comfort levels for everyone. I know appraisers that are licensed in one state that work in their one county. I have others that are licensed in 10 states that work statewide every state. They've done review work for the last 10 plus years for other companies out there, and so they've established the competency throughout completing the course of an assignment. It's another use path. You know, you don't have to have competency to take on an assignment. You can establish it throughout the course of it as long as it's disclosed that way and the client understands it. So, I mean, a lot of these people have obtained their competency throughout their careers of doing review work in other states to where they do feel comfortable they can do a desktop appraiser there now because they've done 150 appraisal review assignments in that county. You know, so there's a lot of ways to look about how you're getting your competency and, and the data that you have access to, right? Um, so Tony talked all about uh, desktop appraisals and the compliance piece of it and USPAP, and I just wanted to give you guys a little bit more background on computer share in general. So as you're thinking about trying to take on a client, you understand who we are and, and our background. Um, computer share is a massive $8 billion market cap company that was started in Australia in 1976. Um, they were their first to kind of digitize and, and store stock uh, registries on computers instead of paper stacks. And throughout their course of their business being successful, they've grown to number one and number two in every market that they worked in. And they were looking for ways to expand their business. And about seven years ago, they started getting into the mortgage business. And they purchased up uh, specialized loan servicing and specialized asset management, which are two companies in Colorado. They're nationwide loan servicers. They serve for all the big banks and um, internally had a valuation department that did BPOs and value recons for those loans on that servicing book. Uh, myself, Tony most recently, and a couple other folks came on and we were taking that outward and going out and engaging these clients directly ourselves. Instead of focusing on just our internal servicing client, we're opening ourselves up to third party clients across the country and providing those services outward to the marketplace. Uh, we've got a solid background of people um, from the mortgage industry. Our president has 20 plus years in the mortgage business, had his own valuation company, was one of the initial founders of Fiserv, um, has been in this space and this market for 20 plus years. Tony already talked about his experience. I've got uh, 10 years in valuation with about eight years prior in the financial world in um, banking and mortgage origination. So under computer share, we have property solutions. Property solutions is where our AMC falls up underneath. So um, when you guys see written formal communication for me, it's computer share valuation services. That's our licensed AMC. Um, but we all are known as property solutions. And that encompasses REO, title, asset management, and property valuation. On the valuation side, we offer the full gamut of valuation products. Um, we're a traditional AMC, we do BPO services, the hybrid appraisal products that we've been talking about today, um, full property inspections, and the property inspections today are on the, the servicing book of business. Loan goes into default every you know, 60 days, they need to send eyes on the property to make sure that nothing, that condition's not deteriorating. Um, so we have a panel and of uh, inspectors across the country as well as inspection uh, companies that we work with to get those done. Um, we also do value recons, which is the non-signature work we were talking about. Um, looking at commercial uh, valuation products as we roll out, and then we do resell AVMs from some data providers and data analytics companies. So the ARA product is the appraisal risk analysis. I know Ron's done quite a few of these for us. Um, definitely a couple people in the room have. Um, but this is a standard three appraisal review product. So you're not doing primary valuation. You're looking at an origination appraisal that's provided to you. Um, we do a lot of work on the front end to go through and get a lot of information about that property and that appraisal to assist your review. Um, but the main purpose is in pre-funding due diligence. An investor won't buy that loan from that originator until somebody looks at that appraisal and says yes, no, or other. Um, before we even assign the report to you guys, we go out and get MLS public record data. We pull the MLS sheets off all the comps that were provided in the original appraisal itself. Um, and then we engage you to perform your review. And then it does go through quality control. Every report that goes through our system, a human being looks at it. I have a staff of um, appraisers and non-appraisers that are both in valuation. 
Um, so I do have staff appraisers that perform QC um, internally. Um, desktop Appraisal X, so this is the hybrid that Tony's presentation was on. Um, just what I really wanted to hit on, we talked about this a lot, but um, we do go through and look at that inspection. We make sure we're looking for our highest rank brokers that are closest to the property to engage them for the inspection. There's a lot of companies out there that throw up like message boards and it's just grab boards of whoever responds first that has a camera can go get that picture. We actually rank and scorecard our brokers and our agents and we use people that are also in our BPO network. So they're doing valuation in that neighborhood already uh, before they're out doing the inspection. Um, on our quality control side, we have built in uh, validation rules into the form. So there's soft stops and hard stops to help the appraiser from submitting without forgetting to sign the report or you know, get through the whole analysis and forget to put your value in. Um, we have some hard stops that will just make sure that you've filled it out and have completed the report. Um, but everything does go through a set of validation before it comes over to a human QC analyst to make sure that we can then do a qualitative analysis of that report. Um, may or may not come back to you guys with any questions, but again, 100% goes through our human staff, and we're always available for any kind of phone calls, emails, follow-up questions you have, and have a certified residential uh, SRA appraiser on staff that can also answer any questions about performing the valuation or if you get stuck. I think some of you guys might have talked to Martin. Can I just add, Jameis, those yeah, hard please. steps, while they might at first be a pain in the butt, it, it keeps you from having a revision, right? Um, the, the appraisal's up on your screen, you know, you, you get that red line box when you're filling out a form and you have to go back there and put it in. But you look at it once and it's done. So anything that isn't automated, when you're choosing who to work with, look for these kind of automated things that are gonna take time off of your submission. Yeah, let me you're gonna be more productive. That's a great feature. Yeah. That's a great feature. Everyone knows that I'm really not that technically oriented. We've gone <laughs> over that before. And I gotta tell you, I love this system because first off, I love the data that cascades based on comparability, mm -hmm. okay? That's, that's phenomenal. It gives you a ranking score yep. that you can choose for any of it, but it has, you know, information why that's ranked. That's very helpful. I haven't seen that yet with anybody else. And, and the hard stops are awesome because first, it's a, it's a, a teaching tool. You're gonna learn what, what's necessary mm -hmm. before it goes out to the client and it just comes back. And it's just a waste of time, you know, back and forth. So the hard stops, you know, they, they stop the revisions, and they teach it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. Cuts How down many a lot get of paid the noise. for revisions. <laughs> yeah. So if you eliminate them, that's that's a good thing, and that's that's one thing you should look at when you're choosing who to work with. Um, what what's the technology? What are the what? How is it designed, and how is it going to save you time and make you more money? I'm sorry, Janice. No, oh, thank you. I appreciate it. So of our panel right now, we have a little over 10,000, pushing 12,000 brokers and agents that work on our BPO panel. So we have access to that many people to do the inspections across the company. It's a much more granular panel than our desktop appraiser um, panel, and I think that's, that's a good thing. I've had discussions with clients in the past of, well, how many appraisers do you have? And I've got up to three, 350 appraisers that I know of that like to do desktop work that have been trained on these type of products. And a lot of times they'll argue you and say, well, that's not granular enough. They're not in that market. Um, there's a big difference between knowing how to do desktop work and not. And analyzing a lot of data, Bart's heard me say this before, cutting through the noise that you see and isolating and focusing on what's important and relevant to that review is a skill that not everybody has. A lot of people need to look at tons and tons of data and spend four hours analyzing everything to put a number on the property. And that, that's great if that's how they want to You're do the work. Just piggybacking off of my, what, what we do, our trained, what we do, <laughs> look for the red flags. Right? Yeah. Don't reappraise the property. Don't do a technical analysis. Do a risk analysis. Right. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You're looking on on the ARA type product. Yeah. You're you're looking to call out deficiencies. There's there's a lot less misrepresentation today than there was ten years ago. Um, but people still make mistakes, or they miss an externality. They forget that there's actually a dirt pit on the other side that's got a dirt bike racing track on it. I mean, I've seen some of those before. And, you know, um, looking for those, those nuances of, of what's important and how, how to call it out in your review is major. Um, everybody on our panel has a um, background check. We go back 10 years. Uh, we do OFAC reviews, um, full on FBI background check to become part of our panel. So we trust the people that we're partnering with. Um, and we do require e &O insurance. I know a lot of you guys have actually hit me up on that individually. Ron's had it too. Mm -hmm. um, there are some companies out there in our space that don't require e if you're only doing desktop. 
we don't. We do require E&O across the board for everybody that's going to be on our panel, and I think that just helps protect everyone involved. Almost everybody does today. Um, oh, that's yeah, good to hear. Oh, oh, I mean, almost everybody does today because it's evolved so much more. There's so much re more review on desktop products. So uh, <clears throat> we identified a couple that are very economical. Oh, good. You know, good. Policies. I think, I mean, it's just, it's the CYA for everybody, yes. right? You, you yes. want to make sure that you have it. Um, you know, our company's got it, covers all my staff appraisers. Everybody's listed in there as well. Um, and we want to make sure that we're all uh, covered for our liabilities. That's right. Um, as far as the desktop and hybrid work, we have been putting on a couple of training sessions where you jump on the phone and my team will walk you through. We'll do screen shares. We walk through our system, how to navigate the portal, how to look at the forms. Um, we do have a quick competency test that we send out afterwards. And once you've done that once, then you're approved to do the desktop work with us. Uh, there are plenty of folks that I've worked with in my prior career that I know they have three plus years of experience and I know that they're really good at what they do. And I will pull some waivers now and again for the training and the testing because I know they already understand the scope and how to do these type of products. Um, but I do encourage taking the training. It's a really quick, it's like 45 minutes to go over two different forms on our system and be able to help navigate quickly through the system of how to accept an order, decline an order, and complete it and how to use the comp research tools. And we have a lot of form filling buttons built into our system as well. So when you like a comp and you pick it, you just select it, hit save, and it populates the grid for you. Um, one of the new uh, features that we're rolling out on our comparables tool right now today, you just get an interactive map where you can zoom in and out and check on the neighborhood. You can do aerial or satellite, however you like. Um, but you get just this static list that you can filter and sort but it's, it's, not, it's not as technology, technologically advanced as I'd like it to be. I'd like it to be a lot easier to use. Uh, we're bringing in buttons that will be direct links to the MLS sheets. So while you're on a page of 30 or 40 sales, you'll have access to the transfer history and MLS sheets for that comp right on that page. And you can see all the interior photos, read the broker comments, get everything that you need in our site without going outside of it. And there are markets where MLS data is light and lacking and we have to go back and engage local brokers or hope the appraiser that we can find may have their own local access to be able to do it with their data. Um, but the majority of the metro markets across the country, we supply everything that you need to be able to work right in our site. If you live in a city where there's a pro sports team, this works really good. <laughs> <laughs> you get out in the middle of nowhere and not so good. Yeah. Pennsylvania, New Jersey have been challenging. I just wanted to add, now Ron, as we know, is technically challenged. Technologically challenged. He he still uses the caps lock button to cap a letter, and then he has to press it again. Is there an, is there another way? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tony. I'm my back. Okay. But he has found your guys' platform to be the easiest to use. Uh, well, it's very empowering when you you're so technical, challenged like that, right? Yeah. And so you can go through a system. And you know the checks and balances, and it shows you it pops up, the formatting. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll bet you there's a few people in here that's a little concerned, not that great with technology too. <laughs> okay, they just don't want to admit it. Oh, Don, thanks. Good. Good. I was I was gonna pick on Kathy and ask her what she thought because I know she's worked in there too. <laughs> I think she's pretty good. She's a little too smart. But anyway, but no, you know that's uh, the technology. It really the form is, the buttons will be helpful. Mm -hmm. Because I have gone outside the system in Google for the MLS, so yep. this will make it quicker. Uh, but the rest of it is really, it's very compatible. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that enhancement because it'll help my team too. Because we go back and we re-review everything that you guys do. And so we go back and look at the comps, were they appropriate, pull up MLS sheets, look at the interior photos, and do a very abbreviated version of the work you've done. I do have one question. Did I not receive an email from you that you're like going to the ACI platform, something mm -hmm. about that? So we are for traditional appraisal. So if you're doing 1004s and ACI that supports the, the XML versions of the forms, okay. uh, yeah, we are going to use that for, for 1004s. Not for desktop at this time. Okay. It's essentially already built I'm, in, the hard stop rules Jameis was yeah. talking about. Uh -huh. That's what ACI does. So at upload, it's going to identify if you didn't sign it. Right. It's going to push it right. back to you so you can sign it right away and then well, upload I it Well, I work again. for a company and they are on the ACI platform doing desktop. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I just wondered if you were going to a similar... If, 
if I do, I'm going to build my forms the way I want them to look in there. I won't be adopting some standard desktop form from ACI. Okay. So we could. It'll just be a different place that you log. You wouldn't even have to worry about it. Our system would take you right there like once you log in. Yeah, it is. They, right. They've got a really cool tool for forms too, where you can build out um, proprietary forms of how you want it to look. They also support all the traditional 1004s, 2055s, um, and that kind of product. And we have that technology. But, it's called Clear Value Consulting. The platform we use is called Acuity. Mm -hmm. uh, the platform that ACI uses, other you know AMCs choose to use it. It's same thing, different company. Yep. Okay. Chevrolet, Ford. Mm -hmm. And it's not any kind of version where we'd pass fees to our appraiser to upload there. I have heard of companies that charge, you have to, you have, to have an uh, account with ACI yourself, and that's you wouldn't have to do that with us. No, it, you don't have to have an account. She does them too for us. Uh, yeah, not for them. No. But I have to pay plenty of 6 and 7 and $10 fees all the time. Mm -hmm. Really? For, to um, appraisal companies for 10 hours. Yeah. For some reason, I thought I paid you to do the work. I just thought it's kind of how I like to do it. It adads up, too. Oh, I bet. It does. I it was really looking at my up. credit card, 10, 10, 10. But, but don't you all raise the price? Bullet too. Yeah. We I try, and, we and then try. they push back. Yeah. No, I get a new client. On hybrid work? How many of you are slow? So, I mean, you don't have as Tony work. pointed out, my goal is to make people $100 an hour. I have enough. So, so I, let I, let yeah. Slower. Like like yeah, fine. Uh, but what is the CFC for doing a hybrid? Yeah. Okay, so Wayne Wayne asked what about Bullet Two, just competitive fees and wondering what our fee structure is. So the two products that I touched on briefly, the ARA and the Appraisal X, both of those are fifty dollars in assignment. Um, we are going to be rolling. I'm, I'm working on an interior version of the Appraisal X, which I plan on paying sixty because I know you're going to have to look at more photos and spend a little bit more time to do the analysis. Uh, but you won't have to pick any additional comps. So. As Tony mentioned, our goal and my goal has always been to try and get this type of work to help appraisers make $50 an hour on average working, or excuse me, $100 an hour so working from home. Basically, the, the expectation is that your product is going to take about a half an hour to complete. Correct. Probably on less, average. once you get really good at it. On average. And because there will be the some automation. that are, take a little bit longer, and there will be some that take a little less. So are you doing work in Oregon? Oregon? Mm -hmm. Man, let's see. Last time I called somebody in Oregon, I got... I don't answer my phone for more than a or less than a thousand dollars, and then he hung up. And then we called him back and paid him a thousand dollars while I tried to find other appraisers to do yeah. desktop work. Um, <laughs> I don't think it was. I did. It was better than not getting it done for the client that I was trying to bring on. Well, in, or in Oregon, we're of a different breed. <laughs> Depending on the markets, and, and Oregon has been a challenge. Um, I do have some people in Oregon now, um, which has been. A lifesaver to not pay a thousand dollars for a desktop anymore, um, but I'll take bullet one. There you go. All right, great. <laughs> Thanks, Wayne. Just, just, <laughs> just send me ten jobs a day at fifty bucks. I'm happy. Okay. Yep. You know, that, you know, that, let's. That's where I want to be. I've or, I'm, I average five hundred dollars doing different products anytime I want, but the but to do ten at fifty. No 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 uh, expenses. Yeah. Still gives you time for golf and lunch. And well, that's mm -hmm. just it. Yeah. Exactly. You'll have you'll have a little bit of a problem in Oregon now because just yesterday the VA raised their fees to eight hundred bucks. Finally. Oh wow. Yeah, but how long does it take you to do a ten oh four in Oregon? I don't, know, I don't keep track. One a day. One a day. So hundred bucks an hour. Mm -hmm. You're buying MLS. You're driving out to the houses. You're putting a lot of gas and miles on oh, your car. Hey. That's why I $100 an hour at the desk. <laughs> that's why, that's bullet why, number one. No, no, he said bullet number yeah. one. You know, I, just <laughs> with a, a good friend of mine, you've heard me speak about him, and he's out in the field. And so we compare at the end of the month, not to compare each other, but how'd you do and how'd you do on. And so I told him I made $8,000, you know, last month. And I said, yeah, it was a pretty good month. You know, I took some time off, too. Uh, and he said, well, and he said, well, I made 8000 I said, can I go back? It's great. He said, no, it's not. He said, do you know how much more? And he expenses that I had than you, and and he was going through them. I was like, that's a lot of expense. You're talking 25 percent if you're talking a nickel. Oh yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, and all the additional hours to get the work done. And all the, yep. And I said, by the way, all the time you were driving, I went to the gym three times this week, <laughs> and half the hour four. <laughs> Lacey, that, that math really doesn't patient. seem right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we don't have one yet. I think I do. At this point. 
to I do have to, e class. I, if I can, I do have to make a correction to what I said. I was t not like y'all wrote down notes. I was saying advisory opinion 20 for that appraisal services. Appra it's advisory opinion 21. Just want no to make sure that I, well, but I, I yeah, but when they, but they went but to look it up, it would have been really bad. Well, you know, it depends on whether there's a test at the end of the class on how much we're paying no, attention to no, which no, AO no. it is, because, you know. The reviews is a pri uh, uh, 20, we number 20. Get, we have the concept of the classes. We get through the class, we pass the test, then we're like, I don't care which AO what it was. Yeah. Just don't break the rules. <laughs> Makes you feel any better. I'm not an appraiser, and I still take used PAP classes every year. So, I'm so boring. I don't know why I do it. I kind of, and I do have a copy of the soft copy on my desktop at work. Yeah. So in theory, this work can be done anywhere. Yep. There are there certain states that you need extra help? Yes. <laughs> you know, they're, they're all of them, really. Um, and I'll let Jason, Jameis speak, but uh, we're, we're growing, so we need depth as well as breadth. Yeah. And there's yeah. some areas where we don't have specific coverage, like Swiss cheese, but we need... Yeah you know, more mm -hmm. appraisers in certain areas. And we really are at a turning point, it feels like, to me, for our business. I've been telling my staff and, and Ron and people I've talked to in, the, in this room for a year and a half that I just thought it was, all right, it's, it's going to blow up right now. But it's really coming down to the wire for us with some really large clients that we're onboarding. And they are nationwide. And they're going to come to us. And you know, a test order is, OK, here's 1,000. Get them done in That's five days. And so we are really at a point where we're it's not going to be tomorrow, but in the next, I feel like the next two, three months, I'm going to have consistent work all across the country. And I need as many appraisers that like to do this type of work as possible. I would say, you know, and I can, two or three you can email me about the need. state thing, because I need, I need to do a little bit of a breakdown of, like, no coverage versus spare coverage versus where I think more volume will come, and we can support more folks. And be open to desktop appraisals. Uh, reviews, reconciliations, yeah. anything yeah. that keeps you in front of the computer, and you'll, you'll get much more work. And yeah. diversify. Don't do all your work for us. Yeah. I mean, I encourage right. you to get other clients, too. Right. And compare. That you want licensed in the state. Correct. Correct. So Correct. Yeah, these two products that were up on this screen, that's, uh, they are considered appraisals, 100% underused PAP. You need to be state yeah. licensed or certified to complete them. Is your in-house review staff in-house in Colorado? Yeah. No one in India. <laughs> yeah, no. I, <laughs> we employ no underwriters and no one in India yeah. or Philippines. Yeah, I, I have zero. All of my staff is on site in Highlands Ranch, Colorado. Uh, except for one who actually lives in Washington. She works remote for me. Are these the only two products that you offer uh, appraisers to do? It's well, uh, appraisal X and for kind of non non traditional appraisal type work. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I have a variant of the appraisal risk analysis called the investment property analysis, and it doesn't have a lot of traction. We have a one client that ordered a couple of them, um, but they look it's same it's looking at a single family property, but also bringing in rental data and determining an estimated monthly rent amount. That's easy. Very easy. Um, I don't have a ton of it right now, and I'm kind of reconfiguring the product a little bit, but it is a variant to the ARA, um, especially with a single family rental space that's happened across the country. There's a lot of potential for it there. Yeah, there's a lot of big companies that purchased mm -hmm. a lot of that's properties, smart. Smart. Yep. and then they need that for their, for probably for their accounting and stuff like that. There's a lot of lenders that are lending based on the cash flow of the potential for that property too, and weighting the credit score less of the borrower, and they're looking more at the cash flow analysis that can come through. So having those rentals um, help. Um, and then we'll, we're going to have, I mean, we, we advertise ourselves to our clients as a really nimble company that can customize solutions that, base their, that meet their needs. And so if we work with somebody and they see something that we have, but they're like, you know, I'd like to add maybe four or five other different components to it, we'll build custom products as we go, too. So this is really the initial offerings that we, we know that the market already uses and consumes, but we are wide open. The one constant, I think, is the involvement of the appraiser. You might see the inspection vary, whether it's um, an inspector or a homeowner. I don't think we're even close to having homeowners do inspections, but we will. Um, different technology. There's companies looking at how homeowners mm -hmm. do their own inspection and how you control for you know taking the picture this way instead of showing the you know whatever is over here. 
Um, so I think we'll see variations on that, but right now the appraiser is always going to be a part of that equation. So you guys, I put a, each of you a handout down. That's just really got the email to my, my small team. I like to call him my recruiting team. His name is Sean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we've all got to wear a bunch of hats today, uh, right now. So uh, my team's small. I've got a team of five right now that's here to support you guys. You'll, you will, when you call, you'll talk to the same person. You'll see the same names on emails. Um, we really like to partner with our appraisers. And, and I use the word partner. I hate the word vendor. We, we don't. I, my clients call me a vendor and it irks me so much. I'm like, no, I'm really partnering to help you from making bad loans. <laughs> um, but yeah, that email address you can send some info to um, as well. Ron's got my contact info. Contact and info. feel free to reach out anytime. On the program site, we have it uh, along with uh, our video will be up there. So get approved. You get approved. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time today.